Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Chris, I'm 28, I'm from Bournemouth. Uh, Google would make you think that Bournemouth looks like this. Most of the time it actually looks like this. Um, I help organize PHP Dorset, and I'm also a member of my local WordPress user group. Uh, and I work for a company called Three Sided Cube. So we make apps, most famously for the American Red Cross. And uh, occasionally, we also need to make CMS websites. And for this, we use WordPress. So WordPress has a big focus on its users. It's packed full of features that make it easy to make a blog or website, sometimes even something bigger than a website. And its strength is that it's very portable, and you can run it on almost any setup. Uh, it rarely breaks uh, backwards compatibility. So it covers a lot of different users' needs. But in doing so, it ends up getting a lot of stick for not being the easiest to maintain or maybe collaborate with, with multiple developers. However, it's easy to forget that it's not there to be my perfect developer framework. It's there for the user. It's all about them. And that's why it's so ubiquitous. After all, if we look at the internet, 27% of it is run on WordPress now. And as PHP developers, we have some great tools that help us develop our applications. So there's no reason why we can't use WordPress, um, these tools with WordPress, to make building and maintaining our apps easier, especially within a team. So this talk is about how we brought our WordPress development in line with how we work with our other favorite frameworks. So, and these are all suggestions, so they're not the only way you can do these things, but uh, these are tried and tested, and they work really well for me, so I'd like to share them with you. So the most important tool, I think, that I use is version control, uh, the most popular of which is Git. So Git is vital because it helps us see who changed what and when. Uh, we can have multiple people working on uh, files simultaneously. We can work in features in parallel, and we can roll back to previous versions. And all that's really important because ultimately it means we can go home on time. Uh, so if you've not used Git with WordPress before, you could do a lot worse than just stick the whole thing into Git. Uh, so let's take a look at our project here. Uh, so this is a fresh WordPress install straight out the box. And uh, here's Git. Um, but of course, it's a CMS, so it's not quite that simple. And it's because of this. This is WordPress's file editor. It lets you edit things like CSS files and plugin files. So it means what's on the server isn't necessarily what's in our repo, because our users can change our code base. And that reduces how useful it is to have a repository. And there's a really easy way to prevent this, and it's by adding this line. So this goes into wp-config, which is WordPress's config file. Uh, and it's a prime example of how WordPress lets you customize your experience with it. And there's a ton of these settings, and you'll see more as I go through this talk. Uh, this is another one, for example, which prevents automatic updates from running. Uh, incidentally, if WordPress detects that you're using something like Git, uh, it turns off automatic updates anyway, but I just like to be explicit and add this option. So this is the file I've just edited. This is wp-config, and it's where WordPress keeps most of its settings. There's also some in the database. So I can commit that change now, and that's great. So I've got all these files in here, uh, and the only files I actually want to edit are in this folder, the WP content folder. And that's what I call my application. So that's where the code that is going to be different for this WordPress site to other WordPress sites lives. Now, I don't want to touch any of these other files. It's really hard to see where my application code is in here for all the other files that are part of WordPress core. So I've gone and tidied this up a little bit. So WordPress lets us move files and folders around. So what I've done is I've created a folder called WordPress, and I've moved all of the core files for WordPress into that folder. Now, wp-config isn't a core file. It's created by the wizard, uh, and WordPress will look for that in the same folder as all the WordPress core files, or actually in the folder above. So it's OK to stay there. Uh, but WordPress doesn't know where the core files have moved to. When index PHP gets hit, it'll try and load in the uh, WP head, and it won't be able to find that file. I need to tell it where I've moved it to. So I need to make another change to wp-config. This, uh, this code already exists in that file. All I need to do is add WordPress to the end of it to tell it that I've moved these files. I also need to make a change to the database. So some config um, options are stored here. 
and we've got site URL and home URL here. And the problem with that is that these aren't very well named. I think they're quite confusing, uh, especially where they have the same value by default. But essentially, site URL is where those core files live, and I need to update that as well in the database. So where is our application code now? Well, if I go into WP content here, this is where um, we've got plugins and our themes. That's what our application is. And WordPress comes out the box with um, a ton of uh, things like Hello Dolly as a sample plugin, and it's got a load of themes with 20 appended to the start of it. Um, so I could put my plugins and my themes in there, but I don't really want to mix my application code in with all of WordPress's stuff that it comes out the box with. So what I've done here is I've created a new folder. I've called that WP content, so I'm maintaining the, um, the naming structure that WordPress is used to, that I've got a WP content folder in the root of my project still. Uh, and I'm going to put my plugins, my themes, into here. So I need to tell WP config about this change too. So you see I've got advanced custom fields as an example of a plugin, uh, the debug bar, and my own very awesome plugin there. Uh, and yeah, so I just need to make a quick change to WP content. I just add these two lines, and then it knows where to find this stuff. So now I have a clear separation between what's WordPress's code and what is my application code. And this is a massive improvement. And yes, I know what you're all thinking. All I've done is gone and moved the folder around. But, and also, why did 2016 take all the good memes from us? And what does that have to do with version control? Well, now we have WordPress's code contained, we have the ability to do something that I feel the PHP community could maybe do a little less of and ignore WordPress. So here's a git ignore file, and in there I've added the entire WordPress folder to that git ignore. Because ultimately, I'm not going to be making any changes to any of those files, so I don't need to keep track of it in my version control. WordPress has its own version control system for that. Um, so let's see what that looks like if I check it out from Git. So I do a Git clone, and I get these files. But there's one missing, so WordPress is gone. Don't look too happy about that. We could work out that we need WordPress in here because we've got a WP content file. So we could just download WordPress and stick that in there. But what version of WordPress do we need? Is this a really old project? Is it going to work? The only thing we do know is that this project is dependent on WordPress. It's not going to work without it. Now, if only we had a way to manage that as a dependency. Well, we do, and it's called Composer. So we have Composer in, in PHP, and there's a misconception that it isn't compatible with um, WordPress's workflow. It is. It's just not as easy out the box as it would be with something like Laravel or Symfony, because it doesn't have a Composer description file. Now, there is an RSC out for it to add one. I'm not here to debate whether or not um, WordPress should have a Composer description file. The only thing I do know is that it hasn't happened for a while, and it's probably not going to happen for a long time. But for us to be able to manage WordPress as a, as a dependency, we need Composer um, we need a composer description file in WordPress. We need it to have one. Now we could make our sorry, we could make our own fork for each minor version of WordPress uh, and store that in our own repository, but we need to update that every time there's a minor version. So thankfully someone's already done this for us. So this is a composer package which is an automated fork of the WordPress core. It updates every 15 minutes and it's mirrored on packages and it has all the tags and all that sort of stuff. And it's got one million installs, so it's not just me that uses this. This is really popular now. Best of all, Composer will install those missing files to that WordPress folder that I'm missing. How does it do that? Uh, to explain, I need to explain a little bit about how Composer works. So this is Monolog, which is just a simple PHP library for logging. It's the most simple example I could think of. And that has a type of library. So most Composer packages have this type of library. And that's going to install to the vendor folder. Uh, this one has its own type of WordPress core, and that will install to the WordPress folder. And it does that using something that's called a, a custom composer plugin. Um, and it's written as part of this package. And you can write your own. It's, it's actually really cool. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of stuff, come find me in the social afterwards. Um, but back to composer. So I'm going to initialize composer here, and I'm going to require this package. 
and then I'm going to run Composer install. And I get something like this in my Composer JSON file. And this is great, because if I want to update WordPress now, all I need to do is run Composer update, and my WordPress updates. So uh, that's added a Composer JSON file, and WordPress is back. So now we have a dependency manager. What else in here is a dependency? If we look in our content folder, we've got our plugins and, my th and our themes. So I didn't write advanced custom fields, for example. That's a third party um, plugin. Uh, but these don't have uh, composer descriptions either. So that's where WPackages comes in. So this is a custom repository like Packagist, but it's a mirror of WordPress's plugin directory. Uh, and it will, in, uh, sorry, these have their own types of WordPress plugin and WordPress theme. And they're going to install to um, a folder called WP Content, which is in the root of the project, which you'll notice is what I called my new folder there. So that's, uh, that's just going to install plugins and themes exactly where I want them to. And it does that using something called Composer Installers, which is um, just, it basically helps Composer install things into the right places for all of your favorite frameworks. So it's not just WordPress, it's worked with Drupal, Joomla, um, lots of things. Uh, so because this isn't on regular package, uh, packages, I can't use a Composer Require yet. So I've just typed this into Composer JSON myself. Uh, tips on getting this right. Uh, if you go to the WordPress plugin directory and you want to know the name of the package, it's the slug, essentially. Uh, to get the version number, go to the change log, and you've got version numbers there. And this is a good indication, if you look through the change log, of whether the plugin is using semantic versioning or not. You should be able to tell what kind of plugin it is. Um, for themes, for example, they usually don't have any versioning, so you just have to use the the Death Star, the, uh, the asterisk. Um, so I've locked this to 4.4, Advanced Custom Fields. So I've not put a tilde or a hat on the front of that because I don't necessarily trust this to use semantic versioning. But I know exactly what version I want this to be running on. And if I did want to update Advanced Custom Fields, I'd just change this number and then run Composer Update. Um, so I need to tell Composer where to find this package. So I need to add into my Composer file uh, the repository of W packages. So then when I run Composer install, it knows where to find this package. You can also do dev packages. So now I've got that repository in there, I can run Composer require again on the command line. And I've added the dev flag here because I want the debug bar, but I want to optionally choose whether I'm going to install that plugin. So um, I run Composer require with the dev flag for my local development, so I've got that handy debug bar, but I don't want it on my production server, so I just run a normal Composer install, and then I get, um, I get just the, the ones which are in that require block. And this is where Composer starts to become really powerful for managing our plugins for us. So now I have uh, these, uh, advanced custom fields and the debug bar. They are um, they're managed by Composer. So I can ignore them from my version control. I don't need to keep these in my repository either. So I've just blanket ignored all of the plugins folder here. The, uh, the dot git keep there just keeps the folder itself. Uh, so that handles those. But what about my awesome plugin that I wrote myself? So there's a couple of options here. You can um, leave it in your repository. So uh, it's part of my application. It's single use. I'm not going to use this for any other website. Uh, very bespoke plugin here. Um, so I've just not ignored it in the gignore, a bit of a double negative there. Uh, so that's option one. Option two is that I can make it public, so I could submit it to WordPress's plugin directory. But uh, on the downside of that, it can take a while, especially if there's lots of plugins in the queue. You're really kind of at their whim as to when that can get, you know, when you're trying to ship things, that can take a while. Um, it's also likely that you don't want this to be public code. Uh, so option three is if this is a plugin that I want to use across multiple installs and I want to be able to use Composer to pull into my repository, what I can do is I can host the plugin in a repository on GitHub. Um, and that's the same for if you've got any private plugins that you've maybe paid for as well. They won't be on W packages, so you can use the same technique for this. So um, here's my plugin in all its glory on GitHub. Note how very awesome it is. And uh, this is good because I can tag versions of my plugins and I can lock my different apps down to different versions. So to explain, 
if I've got version one, which was kind of awesome, and uh, I put it onto site one, and that, I tag that as version one, that's the first version, that's cool. I then make it a bit more awesome, and I tag it as version two, and I start using that on the second site, but uh, maybe I've broken some backwards compatibility there, and I don't want to upgrade my first site. Well, because I've got that locked down to version one in Composer, it can just carry on using version one, and that way I don't have to maintain two different versions of the same code for the plugin. It's all contained in the same repository. Git just takes care of that. I tag things, and then I can upgrade when I want. And by doing this, we also completely avoid, sorry, we also completely avoid the review queue, which is um, WordPress's own plugin directory. So let's have a look at my plugin a little bit closer. Here's my um, Composer JSON file. Uh, and in here, I have the, uh, just the standard stuff you need for, to describe to Composer what this file, uh, what this package is. So I've got a name and I've got a description there. And the important bit here is that I've said that it's a WordPress plugin. And I've required Composer installers as part of this description to tell it that it's dependent on that. So that then Composer knows to just install this into my the, the correct folder that I'm expecting it to. So now I'm back in my WordPress Composer file. I apologize if that's a bit of a jump. I've gone from the plugins Composer uh, JSON and now I'm in my it back into my WordPress site, and this is this is there. So uh, if my plugin is public on that repository and it's mirrored on Packagist, then I can I can just use this straight away, and that will just work. But it's likely that I'm going to have this as a private plugin. It's not going to be mirrored on Packagist. So I need to add the repository to tell Composer where to find this plugin, and I can literally just give it the GitHub URL and um, give it to type VCS, which is a version control system, and then I'll be able to use Composer to install this. The downside of doing this is being a private plugin, you might have to play around with SSH keys so that um, your server that you're trying to run Composer install has permission to check out from that repository. So it's not for everyone. Uh, but here we go. So all, all my plugins here are now managed dependencies. So what about my theme? Well, I only have one theme. It's very much part of this app because it's custom designed for this app. I'm not going to be using it for a different website. So I just I want that in the repo. That's part of my repository, and that's fine. If I did use any third-party themes, then I could um, use Composer to install those, and then I can ignore them from my version control as well. And then if there's one in particular that I've written myself, I could not ignore that again. But to be honest, I've only got one one theme most of the time, so I just I leave it in the repository. So a caveat of using Composer with WordPress in this way is that you can't just update things. Uh, well, you can. Your users can. They can go and click Install or Update that plugin. Um, but your repo will be out of date if they do. Uh, so you probably don't want them to. Uh, what I do is I make a new role for my clients. So I'm the administrator, and I give them something just underneath that so they don't have permissions to install plugins and things like that. And there's great plugins out there that help you do that. So Members is an example. And you can use Composer to install it. So with Composer, we've defined versions for all of our dependencies. We've got less third-party code in our repository. On the downside, we now have greater reliance on third-party availability. So if a package disappears off WordPress's plugin directory, for example, we've got a problem. We can't install our, our app again. But to be honest, we've probably got that problem anyway, even if we're not using Composer. So I don't see it as a big downside. Uploads is one dependency that we can't manage with, um, with Composer. So I don't commit these. Um, again, I use git ignore to just ignore that whole folder. And that's because I want to keep my repository small. But also, as soon as I've uploaded anything to my repository, my repository is out of date. Uh, sorry, as soon as anyone uploads anything to WordPress, my repository is out of date. And uploaded files, they don't really need versioning. You just sort of upload a new one every time you want to change the image. So I don't need Git to manage that for me. So I don't keep a copy in my repository. So that means that if um, my repository doesn't have any of my uploads in it, how am I keeping a backup of these? 
I personally use the S3 command line tool to back my plugins up to Amazon S3, and I run that on a cron task. It just runs nightly. And there's, if you don't want to mess around with a command line, there's plugins you can use to do that f this for you. Um, Human Made have one. I've never used it myself, personally, but I've heard it's very good. Um, there are others available. And this one, for example, is available on Packagist, so I can just Composer require that as well. And you can start to see how using Composer can really start to speed up um, the installation of everything you need, all your dependencies. So if I've got uploads on my server, and I've got them backed up to S3. What about when I'm working locally? If I check out my project from Git, I'm not going to have any of those uploads. Well, the simplest way for me is that I just run a, an rsync command on the command line to pull down any files that I don't have from the production server. And I use the production server as, as king. That is my source of truth. Um, and anything that gets changed in the database or upload-wise always happens on the production server, and then I just pull from it. Uh, you can use FTP if you don't want to use the command line to use the synchronized command in that. Um, that works as well. Um, with S3, there are other cloud storages available, by the way. Uh, this is just the one I use. Um, we've got a smaller repository, and we're not keeping version control over our uploads. So we've got faster clone and deploy times as well, which is a nice win, especially if your um, images are rather large in your, in your project. Um, and we've got remote backups of our uploads. With databases, version control is tricky. So we could do something like add a MySQL dump to the each commit. Uh, there's actually a plugin called Revisor that tries to do this, but I don't think it's needed. So WordPress has an excellent post revision feature. You can go back and look at different versions of the posts you've made. That's all stored in the database anyway. So all we really need to do here is back the database up. And again, I use the S3 command line tool for that. Um, and then when I'm working locally to get a copy of the database, I just do a, a MySQL dump on the server, copy that down, and then install that onto my machine. Uh, if you're using WPCLI, for example, there's some nice command line tools that will make that even easier for you. Or if you don't want to use the command line, you can use PHP MyAdmin or any FTP client to, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, MySQL client to do that. There's a potential issue with this, though. By moving these databases around, um, I've got different settings that I need for different environments. So by environments, I mean I've got a production server, and I've got a staging server, and then I've got my local machine, which I'm developing on as well. And they're all going to have different settings. Some of these are stored in WP config, as we saw earlier. Um, a lot of them are stored in WP options, which is in the database. And for every environment, these need to be different. So between my staging and my um, production site, site and home, for example, are going to be different. Now, if I'm syncing my production database over to my staging database to keep that up to date with the latest changes, uh, I need to repeat this task every time. I need to go and edit these. And there is an admin screen for that. You can go to options.php and WP admin and change some of these settings. But you'd have to do that every time you sync your database. Um, so here's a better solution. So you can define some of these settings in wp-config instead, so we can have it in our code. And if these are defined, then WordPress doesn't go to the database to look up these values. It just takes it straight out of this file. That has the added advantage as well, that if your users for any reason went and edited, say, the site URL in the database, it, does, it doesn't matter because it reads from the file instead, and they can't change that. So I've just moved the problem, really, from the database over to my code, because now I have to handle different versions of my code base for different environments. And this will mess up my version control if I'm having to constantly change this around or put comments in and things like that. Now, I could do something like this. So I could define an environment variable on my server. Uh, so that's the vhost in Nginx. And then that exposes an environment variable to PHP that I could then switch on. Uh, and you can do things like check the IP address as well, but I don't find those are particularly reliable ways of doing this. Um, the environment variable is definitely the best way to go if you're going to do this. But there's lots of these settings. There's a whole heap of them, actually. They're all going to be different for the different environments that I need. Uh, on top of that, we also have the added problem that we've got this. So I've got my database credentials in a, the wp-config file 
which I'm then going to commit to my repository. And if you take anything away from this talk, I want it to be this. You should never put your passwords in code that you commit to a repo. What you've got to think about is, could your code base be made open source at any moment? Or could you bring on a freelancer to help work on your project without having to give away all your secrets? Let's put it another way. If I go to github.com and I type this into the search, am I going to find your password? Uh, and this is just an example I mocked up, but I guarantee if you go to GitHub and you look for this, you will find people's passwords. So there's a PHP library for defining environment variables. It's called .n, and if you've used anything like Laravel, it will be familiar to you already. It has the added advantage that you can define environment variables without having to edit anything on your server. You can just do it in your code that you upload. Uh, and we can require this package with Composer. So Composer require, php.env, uh, and then that will install to the vendor folder. So this isn't a WordPress plugin. This is just a standard PHP library, so it's going to go into the vendor folder. And to use .env, you need to create a .env file. It's a well-known uh, plugin, uh, sorry, well-known package here. And inside that is literally just a key value pair of all the secrets that I need, uh, or anything that's going to be different for different environments, uh, like my password, for example. Uh, so to get this to work, um, I need to auto-load this class in to be able to use the class. So at the top of wp-config, I just slap in the um, composer's autoloader. And that means that I can start calling the .env library. And I call the static load function there, and I load the .env file. You can actually call these whatever you like. You can pass that in as a variable. If you don't pass in a variable, you use .env by default. And then I've got all my settings in here. And instead of defining the values in here, all I'm doing is referencing that environment variable. And you can do this a few ways. You've got $server, $env, or getEnv. Pick whichever. It doesn't matter. They, they all work. OK, and the, um, another advantage with .env is that it gives you the ability to do this. So the required function is really nice in that you can tell it what you expect to be in your .env file. So if there's anything missing from that .env file, it will throw a .env exception, which just makes it really easy to debug why your site's not working, because you can see exact, it actually tells you the thing that you're missing. And I ignore it, because I don't want to uh, the whole point of this was I'm um, keeping these passwords out of my repository. So I created a .env file locally, and then I also went and made one on my production server, and again on my staging server. And I did this manually, but I only needed to do it once. Uh, if I want to edit any of these files, it's really uh, these values, uh, it's really easy to just go in and change them. Uh, and if you're using provisioning scripts like Ansible or Puppet or Chef, you can generate this file using uh, variables from your vault. And uh, I'll go into provisioning in a little bit. But for .env, um, it's easy to locate and it's easy to update. We've got an, uh, a configuration for each environment, and it's not in source control, which means we're ready for open source at any point. And it's really easy to store outside of your web root. So by default, WordPress just installs to wherever you install it to, and all those files are web accessible. Uh, if you've got access to change the document root on your server, you can do something like this. So I've created a folder called web, and I've made that my document root. And then I've moved all the web accessible files into that folder. So everything that's now at this level is not web accessible, including my .n file, which is really important, but also my composer file and things like that. It's harder for someone to sniff exactly what configuration I'm using. Inside there, I then have what I need to be web accessible. So to summarize, we're only keeping what we need in our version control. We've got dependencies managed. We've got backups of our uploads and our databases. And we've got isolated configurations for all of our environments. And most of this applies even if you're just making a PHP project. It's not even WordPress specific. This is just good stuff to do. And you're probably asking yourself, how am I going to remember all of this stuff? I can see some people at the front looking a bit like this. Well, that's where Bedrock comes in. So Bedrock is a WordPress boilerplate that I use, um, and it does everything I've just mentioned out of the box, except the S3 backup stuff. But as I say, there are plugins that can do that for you. Now, it does require some server configuration to get it to work, uh, mostly 
changing the document root. And that's something I don't always have the liberty of doing. So as a result, I don't always use bedrock. It depends on the server, it depends on the project, it depends on how much access I've got to, to make these changes. So, um, and that's the reason this talk isn't just, here's what Bedrock does, because uh, I like to apply some of this stuff where I can, um, and when I have worked on projects that are quite locked down, I've been able to use Composer, and I've been able to get that split between my application code and what's WordPress, but I haven't been able to do some of the .env stuff, and, um, but that's, that's why I've kind of gone through the different, different steps of doing this. Uh, with Bedrock, you've got a lot of clever people working on this stuff, and they're keeping it up to date all the time, and that's a really good reason to use it as well. Uh, if you do use Bedrock, there's a couple of naming differences. So uh, WordPress here and WP Content, they rename these, so they're actually called WP and App in Bedrock. And I like the name App. It, it's my application code. It's quite a nice name for it. It does have um, a bit of config you need to, if you're going to change the names of these, and this just goes into the bottom of the Composer JSON file. Um, don't worry about trying to remember this. Bedrock ships with this out the box. Um, the downside with having named that folder app is that it can cause some problems. If you're using a plugin that has some hard-coded links to WP content, I mean, it's probably not a good plugin if it is doing that, but uh, if you need that to work, the easiest way to, to maintain everything working when using Bedrock, when upgrading to Bedrock, is just to make a symlink from WP content, and then everything will carry on working. And the nice thing about the symlinks is that they get stored in the repository, so they'll work everywhere, including in a virtual machine, for example. So when developing locally, you'll likely want to use a virtual machine. I use Vagrant to manage my virtual machines. Um, to explain what a virtual machine is quickly, uh, it's simply put, it's a machine, uh, it's a virtual machine that is an, it's an emulated computer that runs from inside your actual computer. So you can store software onto the virtual machine instead of onto your physical machine. Uh, why do you need one? Well, the problem comes is when I'm developing uh, a site that has different software versions. So I'm going to use PHP as an example of software. There's lots, obviously, um, your web server, Apache Engine X, things like that. But as an example, PHP 7.1 is on my computer. Uh, and WordPress works there. So then I deploy to my server, and that's running on PHP 7.1, and everything just works fine. I then go and work on a legacy project, and that's running on a server that's running PHP 5.2. Maybe I've used something like um, a return type or something, because I'm used to writing PHP 7 now. And then I get a fatal error exception. Uh, if I really want to make sure that what I'm working on is going to work on the server, then I'd have to uninstall PHP 7.1 and install PHP 5.2 on my computer to, to do that. I don't want to uninstall and reinstall PHP all the time. So this is a much better way of doing it. So by using a virtual machine, I've got a virtual machine that has PHP 7.1 and a virtual machine that has PHP 5.2 and all the other differences between the software configurations. So they match what I've got on my remote server. So when I'm developing locally, I know that my site is going to work when I deploy it. It also unclutters your machine, so you don't have to have all that software directly on your machine, and when you delete the, the virtual machine, all that goes with it. That just disappears, so that's great. Uh, we've got our software versions contained, so that's nice. And it's as similar as possible to production. That's really the key here, is making sure that you know everything's going to work between your different environments. On the downside, the share file system runs slow. So I've actually found when I'm editing PHP files and then I go and refresh in my browser, I've actually been too quick to go to the browser. And I get an error where it's loaded half of the PHP file and then it just stops and it throws an error and says you know, half completed words. So um, it can be a little slow. Um, and it's not quite as cool or as hip as Docker. But I don't know much about Docker at this point. It's also very memory hungry, so you'll probably be wondering if you've got, say, 10 or more virtual machines for 10 or more sites, why you haven't got any RAM left. Um, but as I say, I've, having a, um, a virtual machine identical production is really why it's worth using. And how do you ensure that they're similar? So this is where provisioning comes in. So I use Ansible. The chef and puppet are also alternatives. And to explain what Ansible does, it's a script that I run that tells the server what to install on it. So here I'm telling my virtual machine, hey, go install PHP 
And then I can do the same, run the same script for my production server as well. And I go, hey, you have 7.1, and another one, and another one. It will do exactly the same thing every time I run it. So this means I can provision servers with a single command, which is just a joy to watch if you've ever seen it. Um, you've got very descriptive configurations in Ansible. That's why I like it the best out of the three. I think it's just really clear and easy to see what it does. Um, item potency, so every time I run this, I'm going to get the same, which means I've got reproducible servers. So if my server disappeared off the face of the Earth one day, I can get my server back in less than an hour because I can just run the script against it to build a whole new server, and then I can get my backups and my uploads out of S3 and deploy my code from my Git repository, and I'm ready to go again. Now, originally, I wrote my own Ansible scripts to manage my... WordPress installs, but it was a lot of work to keep that up to date. And that's where Trellis came in. So Trellis is um, another project by the same people who run Bedrock, uh, and it comes with a Vagrant file as well as Ansible scripts, so you've got your whole developer environment there for you. And um, it has multi-site, which is cool, and it's got WPCLI out the box. It's got a lot of nice um, sugar in there. And uh, it's got deploy scripts that have build hooks, which are really nice for all your gulps and your grunts and things like that. I'm not really that front endy, but front end developers love that. And uh, it's got an active open source community again. On the downside, it usually does more than you need. So it's like WordPress itself, it's trying to cater for a whole range of use cases. Um, so you will find that, that those provisioning scripts are putting a lot of tools onto your server that maybe you don't need. And it's really fiddly to update, uh, so is Bedrock. And, and this is where uh, I don't like them as much, because uh, the I found the best way to update them is to do this, which if you're git through strong, you might be able to do. It took me a while to get my head around it. I had to add an upstream of Trellis, the uh, git repository for Trellis. So that gives me an upstream. And then I can fetch uh, from from the master, I can, I can fetch the latest code from there, and then I do this weird sort of git merge thing. It seems to work, but the problem with doing this is if your, um, your trellis install, you've customized it because you want it to do uh, provision some more extra things or change the way it works for quite a customized install, it means when you then get the latest code from trellis, you're going to get merge conflicts. Things aren't going to work out the box, and you have to go and sort those out. So Trellis is great for generic apps. Um, if you're just running a simple WordPress uh, blog or something, it's great to just use to, um, to get yourself set up with your own server provisioning. But as I say, for highly customized builds, you might want to start from scratch and write your own Ansible. And there's lots, there's Ansible Galaxy, which is a bit like Composer in that it, there's lots of um, pre-written scripts for things like Nginx or PHP that you can pull in and put together. Whether you should use Trellis or not, um, I'm on the fence, pun intended. Uh, my last section here is autoloading. So we've got an autoloader um, that's, uh, that's already in there, and that gives us a lot for, thr for free because it means we can use anything on packages now or anything that isn't. Um, for example, we can use Twig. Twig is my absolute favorite thing to use with WordPress. Um, it makes templating just a joy. And there's a plugin called Timber that um, abstracts some of the loop and stuff away from WordPress that I don't quite understand, uh, which is nice because I don't need to understand it. it. It's abstracted for me. So I use this all the time. And I pull it in with Composer, and I just use it. Uh, Guzzle for HTTP requests. Uh, again, another library I use a lot when I'm interfacing with APIs and things like that. Monolog, you finally got a you're missing PSR3 logger in WordPress. Sentry uh, is great for logging. I mean, these are just all packages that I've used before. Whoops, if you want nicer error handling. PHP unit for testing. Uh, any of the Symfony components you can start using. I've used Symfony console with WordPress. It works really nicely. So now we can start using our CMS like we use all of our other frameworks. So whilst we're working with WordPress, we start to feel like modern PHP developers once again. So I've been Chris Sherry. You can tweet me at Tweeting Sherry, or you can find me on the PHP Dorset Slack channel. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this talk was really helpful, and please let me know if you have any questions.
Do we have any questions? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Rob, I'm 32, a PHP developer, and somehow I've found myself running a WordPress team. Um, this is about your pain. <laughs> <laughs> this was about nine months ago, but I saw one of your earlier talks, and I owe you a big thank you, because we've um, basically implemented everything that you've done, and I cannot thank you enough. I think I'd have, I'd have thrown myself out of a window if it wasn't for what you've done there. Um, and it's nice to see the update. You've done some more work since I saw the original talk. Yeah, there were a few mistakes. <laughs> um, so, and I would, anyone who's not doing this with WordPress should be doing exactly this. This is brilliant. Um, and also currently looking for more developers for my team. So if any of you want a job and want to work like this with WordPress rather than old WordPress, come and talk to me. Um, but I do I have a question. to say this. <laughs> Um, but I do have a question which I think you touched on in the end because mm. the point we've got to is we've got to that point roughly, I think we're just slightly behind where you are. Like we're using Vagrant, we use Scotchbox. Yeah, we're Scotchbox is really nice. We're pulling in things like uh, Eloquent now so we can play with databases a bit better. Oh, nice. Um, but the, the thing about Twig, we, we've hit a bit of a brick wall with the themes because the themes in WordPress, um, they don't you know, follow separation of concerns. They've got mixed business logic and view. Um, could you tell me a bit more and everyone else a bit more about how you've used Twig and how you've implemented Twig to achieve maybe more of a separation of concerns? Well, have you used the Timber Starter theme at all? No. So if you go on GitHub, there is a, a Timber Starter theme, which um, gives you um, Twig templates to get you started, basically. They're just really bare. They just do things like loop over um, posts and things like that. But it's a really good starting place um, to, to start off with, and it's got the controllers, so like page.php and single.php, archive.php, um, and, and interfaces with Twig really nicely there. So that's a good place to start. Um, there's also a project called Lumberjack, which Adam's going to smile at me for, because um, it's a, a project by... Um, by his company, which um, takes it a step further. And they've taken what the Timber Starter team does and what Timber does, and they've, they've kind of um, boosted it with some more stuff that just works really nicely out the box. Um, so I recommend uh, checking that one out as well. OK, cool. Any more questions? Oh, I just want to thank you for, um, for your kind words as well. That's, that's what makes putting all the hard work and prep into making these talks worthwhile. It's, yeah, that's amazing to hear. Thank you. Hi. Um, just a small question. Um, do you disable auto-update for your WordPress sites? Or do you allow your users or sub-admins to update WordPress itself? So I, for my professional projects, for what I do at work, we update them ourselves. We don't give the users any access to do that sort of updating. Uh, and that's because when there's a new version of WordPress out, instead of just trusting it to work, which most of the time it does, but there's always a case that it might not, is we can update locally, we can test it locally, then we can deploy it to that update to our staging server, and we can test it there, and then when we're finally happy that it hasn't broken anything and all our tests pass as well, if we've got any tests, we then merge it into master and then we deploy it. And it's very controlled in that way. That said, I have a couple of personal projects which I maybe don't keep quite as much of an eye on uh, or it's, they're not as business critical as uh, what I do for work. So they get a you know, tiny amount of hits compared to the, the, work, the sites I do for work. And there, I do find that um, my clients, or I say clients, my friends and family, who I've made these websites for, they get annoyed by seeing that WordPress is slightly out of date, and they'll, they want to click that button to update it, and I, I do let them do that. But then every now and then, I just go in and I pull the files down from the um, production site, and I see the diff of what's changed, which is usually just that WordPress is updated. I update WordPress on Composer, make sure that there's no files different there, and then I commit that so I've got the latest version of that. Um, there was something else I was going to say on that point, but I've forgotten it. Thank you. Um, so sometimes with uh, 
projects, you have, um, like I say, you've got dependencies, like plugins and stuff that you bring in. How do you, how do you manage those, like, those ones that are core, uh, can't be turned off? Like, you've got some plugins like um, hmm. Google Analytics, which you only want on production, but there's something like question. advanced custom fields. How do you handle... How do you handle that to make sure that can't get turned That's off? That's a good question. I'm just going to go back to the point I've remembered that I was going to make, which is if you use Bedrock, um, I'm not sure exactly where it does it, but it will basically hide the WordPress needs to update button from the users so they don't see that WordPress is out of date, which is quite nice because then you don't get those calls of people saying, oh, my WordPress is out of date. Um, and if, obviously, if you follow uh, WordPress enough, you, you, you'll be subscribed to some sort of email chain or something like that where you know when WordPress has been updated. Um, for your question, Adam, uh, with um, must-use plugins, so uh, Bedrock has a must-use plugin of its own, which is uh, an auto-loading plugin, which will... <laughs> the thing with must-use plugins is if you want to use them, they're basically just single PHP files. You can't have a, like, a whole folder in there. And what Bedrock has is this, this own must-use plugin, which will effectively allow you to treat normal plugins, which are in folders, like must-use plugins, and they actually will then appear as must-use plugins. Um, if I just jump out of here and I go in, find a slide for a second, bear with me, this one. So um, in here, if you want a, um, a must-use plugin, what you can do is you can add an installer path that is, um, is web app mu plugins, and then the name of the folder, and then in the, in the section at the end there, uh, there's an array there that will take, it says type of WordPress plugin. You can also do type MU plugin, because there are some MU plugins that you can get off the um, uh, WordPress's plugin directory. But you can also d just define the name of packages you want in there. So I could do WordPress, type WordPress plugin, comma, and then <laughs> advanced custom fields, for example. And I can put that in the MU plugin bit of this which means that it will then install it like an MU plugin, but it's actually a plugin. It's kind of a little hack around WordPress, but it means that they can't be turned off. Ultimately, though, I don't think you should be giving your users the ability to turn off plugins and things like that. Um, another solution I've done, which is a little bit simpler, is I, I wrote a little plugin as an MU plugin, so just a single file PHP plugin, which literally just goes on and, and, ins and it activates all the plugins. So as soon as WordPress runs, it just activates all the plugins. So I can't actually turn any of them off. That was nice for a project that I always wanted all of the plugins on. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs>